Okay, so my name is Mary Newton, and I'm the president of the Reading League Wisconsin chapter, and I am joined today by at least a couple other of my cohorts here. I just want to see if there are any others who have joined in that I've missed. Um, first, I want um, Jeannie Schopf to introduce herself. Can you, she's the one with a big Reading League logo in back of her head. Thank you, Mary, and good morning, everyone. Happy Saturday. My name is Jeannie Schaaf. I'm currently a reading specialist, interventionist, literacy coach um, in Sturgeon Bay Schools. Um, I also work for Carroll College as a dyslexia interventionist supervisor, and I'm a board member of Reading League and excited to be here this morning. Great. Thank you. And Maura Moyle, can you introduce yourself, please? Good morning, everyone. I'm Maura Moyle. Um, I'm on the board of the Reading Directors Wisconsin or the Reading League Wisconsin, and I'm also on the faculty at Marquette University in speech language pathology. I'm just very interested in uh, literacy. Thank you, Maura. And our main presenter and organizer for today is Amy McGovern. So I'm going to let Amy introduce herself and then get us started. Okay, Amy. Good morning, everyone. I'm Amy McGovern. I'm the vice president of our Reading League of Wisconsin chapter, and I also work for CSA 9 um, up in Tomahawk, Wisconsin, and uh, I'm a reading specialist, was a literacy coach for years, Title I teacher, so all things literacy um, really is my entire universe at the moment, so and has been for many years. So I am excited to be here with day two with you, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get going. Um, and I will also, well, in a little bit, I'll put the participants copy into the screen. We're gonna do a little bit of review first. So excited to be learning with you, learning together. Um, oops, let me just close that down. Okay. If you wouldn't mind just tossing into the chat where you are from and um, what you teach that we would love to know that. I'm gonna keep things going as you do that, but I know that my colleagues will definitely be watching to see where everybody's from. It's always fun to know. We are on day two and uh, day three is on Saturday, July 9th. These are all central time, 9 a.m. That's when we start again on day three and let's keep going. If you decide to use the reactions button, that is if you've updated your Zoom, you should see the little reactions button at the bottom and you'll be able to put a thumbs up or a heart or raise your hand. Um, we've got plenty of folks watching the screens today. I can actually see you today on my second screen, which is nice. So please feel free to use the reactions button as you are, as we are going. There is a bit.ly that we shared last time. We'll share it again right now pop that into the chat for you. This just has some resources that I consolidated to help support the learning around the writing revolution. So nothing magical here, just uh, some articles about writing, some resources to support your instruction, some video links, and a few other um, resources related to the book that hopefully you'll find useful. Um, if you haven't taken a look at the patent scope and sequence, highly encourage you to do that. It is a great tool um, to help evaluate your overall writing system. And it was developed with William Van Cleve um, in Pennsylvania with a team of, of expert writing instructors there. Uh, it's a great, great tool. So our goal for today, we're going to review some insights from chapter one. Chapter one was really meaty. There was a ton of stuff happening in chapter one. So we want to be sure that if you weren't here last time, you got some reminders of the key elements from that chapter. And if you were, it'll be a great review. This is a good example of spaced practice, um, deliberate practice, good teaching techniques. And then we're going to get into um, sentence expansion and note taking in chapter two. The writing rope. And again, there's several versions of this ground this work. And in the writing revolution, we have um, really all of these are addressed throughout the entire thing. If you're looking at the whole, um, the whole book in its entirety, we are certainly dealing with critical thinking and these chapters we're in right now, lots of work on syntax, grammar and syntactic awareness is really a lot of chapters one and two, not so much on text structure and that's okay, that'll come in later. And um, absolutely writing craft, um, 
right, word choice, that is definitely part of chapters one and two. And because we're asking students to write, um, and we'll ask you to type today, those transcription skills are super important. And we know that the more automatized transcription skills are, the better, um, the more work students produce, and generally the higher the quality of the work. So uh, if you are not in the habit of, of teaching um, explicitly handwriting and getting that practice in, and if you work with older students, giving them time to firm up their keyboarding skills, uh, vitally important for both quantity and quality of the work that they are producing. So a lot of these early chapters in the writing revolution tap into the research on sentence combining, and there is a wealth of research on there. We've included Graham's piece um, on writing next and writing to support reading. Those are, I believe, on the Padlet. And one of the things we know about sentence combining, really the research, the original research on that was done in the 60s and 70s, and it was old, obviously, but old research doesn't mean bad, right? We discovered the vaccine for polio many decades ago, and it's still used today. So old research doesn't mean bad research, but they did update it recently in 2007, fairly recently, and they looked at students who were, um, who had special education needs and they wanted to see if doing work with sentence combining actually helped students perform better in their writing work. And they actually did find that it was beneficial. It just confirmed the earlier research in later research. And so that's what we wanna see in this body of research we refer to as the science of reading. There's lots of replication and lots of, um, validating of previous work and new spins on it with new groups of students. So this is our first question about uh, kind of tapping into that chapter introduction and the chapter one. Writing is best as A, a standalone class, and this is according to the researchers, or B, as part of all subjects. Yep, I'm seeing some answers pop in. Yes, B is the answer. It is definitely better when we incorporate it throughout the day. That is the linchpin, I think, when we think about the writing revolution, it's really rethinking how we use and teach writing across our day instead of having a standalone. Next question, what is this? So we have a Virginia slave, a leader in the movement to end slavery, a conductor on the Underground Railroad, and then we have three um, sentences where we would want to plug in one of those things up above. Do you know what that is called? Oh, we've got Rhiannon and Kim. Rhiannon, I recognize your name from last time. My daughter has a good friend named Rhiannon, so it's a name that I remember. Um, yes, these are appositives. And remember that an appositive is a, is a um, phrase that captures more about the noun that comes right before it. It's a great way to uh, consolidate learning when kids have done a lot of reading and a lot of watching videos and and learning around a topic you can create quizzes that have them line up the noun with the appositive that is describing that noun and it's a great way to check for understanding as well as we don't speak in appositives so here's a chance for you to sort of try that on i've got an example of the butterfly a large flying insect with colorful wings can you do an appositive for either the ant or the bee pause there while you're thinking about a phrase that doesn't start with who or that or which that describes either the ant or the bee. So remember when you're setting, okay, you're writing the positive, the ant, a tiny black insect. It's nice if you have the noun and then the rest of it, the positive that follows it. The bee, an insect that brings pollen from flowers to its queen, good. What was the small annoying insect? Yes. Which one is the small annoying insect, the ant? <laughs> I, I'm quite certain that's the ant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to be the buzzing in yellow. Good. Okay. Um, um, Mary, would you or Jeannie or Maura put the participation deck into it's on the it's attached to the very first slide into the chat um that would be good it's the participate the participants copy or actually i guess i could do it right here i'm just gonna go ahead and do it <laughs> i forgot that i had it open okay 
just going to copy that link and we'll put this into the chat for you so that if you would like to follow along now, you certainly can. Okay, bouncing back here. So nice job on the appositives. Here's some examples of that. Some of them were what you wrote, the bee is super pollinator. That's great. And then you would finish it, right, is uh, we need to protect. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, moving on in our review. What are the fanboys? A or B, coordinating conjunctions or subordinating conjunctions? Victoria says A. Now you're all opening up that participant's copy. Yes, these are the coordinating conjunctions. And can you name the fanboys? You can call them out if you want to just, if you press your space bar, you can just join in and, and it'll just open up your mic for one moment as you speak, or you can put them into the chat. What are the fanboys? Good. This is good review. Remember that we can combine sentences with, with the fanboys for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. Um, these are very appropriate to teach to our younger students all the way up. We want to do sentence work. The other big piece about the writing revolution is that across the board, um, kindergarten through grade 12, we want to do sentence level work in our courses. And that's really easy to incorporate even in science and math and social studies to do sentence level work um, and the fanboys come in handy we want to be able to combine ideas with them and the thing about the coordinating conjunctions is that they connect two things that are of equal weight so they yes. connect two subjects or two predicates or two phrases or two sentences um, where they're of equal weight weight and it also um, has some implications for how you're going to punctuate your sentence if you know that they're coordinating conjunctions as opposed to subordinating. Yes. Yep. And of course, subordinating, remember the idea comes underneath. Um, so it's doesn't they're, stand alone. It's a dependent. So they're clause. not of equal, they're not of they're equal. not equal. You have a yep. uh, an independent clause that's and then you joined it to a subordinate clause that's it's just it's dependent on the other clause so they're not of equal weight yes exactly and there okay. are, are punctuation implications for that as well there sure are and we're going to give you a chance to practice that in um, a sentence combining in the chat <clears throat> this is from level two remember that writing revolution has level one examples for your basic writers, which are often in elementary school, and level two, which would be for your more advanced writers, middle and high school, who have more skills. So this is an example from our level two. This is right out of the book. The periodic table is a chart of chemical elements. The chart displays the elements in horizontal rows. They are displayed horizontally in order of increasing atomic numbers. They are displayed vertically in order of the structural similarities of their atoms. That's four very um, detailed ideas. Can you combine some of those into um, a more complex sentence using some of those fanboys? Anyone brave and want to say their sentence? Thank you for those of you that have your camera on. I see intense concentration happening. All right, I'll go for it. Good. The periodic table is a chart of chemical elements and is dis and they are displayed vertically in order of the structural similarities of their items. Is that right? Yeah. Um, let me see if I can type out your your sentence fast enough. I combine the first sentence and the last sentence. Okay. The periodic table is a chart of chemical elements, and you combine the first and last. So you missed yeah. the ones that well didn't I thought I heard you say horizontal. Say it again. And they are displayed vertically in order of the structural similarities of their atoms. Okay. So you didn't do the second and third? No. Okay.
Anyone else want to go? One more? Oh, here we go. Okay. Ivy, I'll, good. I'll give it a try. Go for it. The periodic table, comma, a chart that displays the elements in horizontal rows is a chart of chemical elements, comma, and they are displayed vertically in order of the structural similarities of their atoms. Is, okay, and you didn't write yours in the chat, right? Okay. No, I used all but the third one. Okay, the periodic, so can you say it one more time? Yeah, the periodic- and I appreciate the commas, that helps you <laughs> say it with the commas, yep. The periodic table, comma, a chart that displays the elements in horizontal rows, comma, is a chart of chemical elements, comma, and they are displayed vertically in order of the structural similarities of their atoms. So you used in a positive in the beginning. I heard it clearly. Yes. Yep. And then you had your ideas listed with the comma in the end. Correct. That's that's a good complex sentence. Nice. There's I see Mary's got one, the periodic table, comma, a chart. Is that the same one? A, a chart of chemical elements, comma, displays the elements horizontally in order of increasing atomic numbers and vertically in order of the structural similarities of their atoms. Yeah, so you can see when we have these four complex ideas, using in a positive helps to capture what the periodic table is. And uh, and then you can use the, the a fanboy in there to help with um, keep the ideas going. Um, it is a chart that. Somebody just raised their hand and now I can't find it. Um, if you raise your hand and you have a question, you can press the space bar and that will unmute yourself and you can ask us that question. I'm sorry. Um, I, just, I, yeah, I raised my hand. I just wanted to note that I left a, a, a comment out of my sentence and I can't figure out how to edit it. So, um, oh, okay. oh yeah. Once you click the go on the chat, yeah. you can't edit so your idea. When, Yes, and when we have a fanboy, that's a coordinating conjunction, right? So that isn't that used to combine two independent clauses, or mm -hmm. two or two independent elements that, uh, like two subjects, you could say, the boy and the girl, and is a coordinating conjunction. It connects those two um, subjects, or it can. Okay, so it can make a compound subject or a compound predicate yes. also. I yes, see. it can. Yes. Uh huh. And that would still be considered a coordinating conjunction? Yes. OK. Thanks. OK. So I mean, you can see how, it, yes, you can write out these four sentences and you get the information across. But when you put them together in one sentence, it kind of uh, orders the information in terms of what's the main point and what are some sub points. Uh, the one the one time I find that students prefer to use the four separate sentences if they is if they've been given an assignment to write something and they have to have a certain number of words in there, you know, then they oh see, I'm going to get a lot more words writing four separate sentences, but it's not the best way to present the information. Trina used a colon. Periodic table, a chart of chemical elements is displayed in two ways, colon, horizontally in order of increasing atomic numbers and vertically in order of structural similarities of their atoms. I think I if you have a colon, does it have to have um, a sentence on the other side? You could, you could use a colon, but I wouldn't use two colons. I'm looking for that one now. It's, uh, yeah. Who, who okay. put that up? Trina, I'll put it up on the screen. Okay. Uh, or I'll just recopy it into the chat. Oh, no, here it is. There's just yeah. one colon in there. There's a comma mm -hmm. and then a colon. You can do it this way. As a colon just indicates um, what comes next is going to expand on or illustrate what you've just said. So here you said it's displayed in two ways. Da da. What are they? Colon. And now here's what they are horizontally and vertically. So this would be a good way to do it, I think. 
it just shows you that there it, there's not just one way to do these things. So, okay. Is there any other question you want to ask about this? Are you ready to move on? Okay, let's keep going. Um, and be brave. I mean, if that's my other message on this is be brave, be, be brave to do this with your students so that, you know, you don't have to know all the answers. You can struggle through it together. And that's a good learning. It's good for them to see you process that. We're a pretty large group. I do group. have a question, actually. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So Wendy. I just typed in there, like sometimes I'll put the same word, the same word, made them read the sentence and then edit it together. Is that useful at this point or no? Like notice yes. in my sentence, like I put columns twice. And then, oh, is that, is that true? Did we, should we have columns there? Like horizontal rows? Hmm. You know what I mean? Like if you read my sentence, it's early in the morning, but. Um, yes, absolutely. And that was where I was attempting to go, but not confident enough to do it. <laughs> so so um, you see how I say the horizontal columns are displayed in order of increasing the atomic number in the vertical columns. And then I'll ask, well, does that make sense? Because I find that I kids are not thinking, they're not, they're not thinking. You give them these sentences and they're just like copying them down. They're not even thinking. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times if you do that, then they can cross that out. Oh yeah, that didn't make sense. And then, or yes. is that just confusing for them when they're learning how to read? Uh, well, this particular one that you're doing is one that would be, um, is one that you would do with older students, first of all. Yeah. So you're assuming that their ability to process with you is is there and you don't need to worry about, it's not a reading task, it's a, it's a language task and you are scaffolding that with them. I mean, obviously you're doing the reading with them, but that's, it's not the same as, um, uh in, in with low with littler kids right so mm -hmm. yes i absolutely think you should um do the work with your students put the, put it up on the whiteboard or uh, you know write them collect them show them and edit them together revise them together for sure uh, that's the power in the teaching of this and if william were here he'd do it much better than or just I as a warm-up like i teach yes. yeah like i teach grade nine science mm-hmm you like teach even as a science, warm up, yeah. you could have those simple sentences starting and then, yeah, and then just give them the sheet and say, okay, this is your ticket today. Can you write a complex sentence with this? And I'm going to have a look at that. A hundred percent. Yeah. And fix the sentence. And fix the sentence. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah. if you can do, if show an okay. example of a clean model at the end, so you're not leaving anything un, <laughs> undone, that would be good. Yes. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's keep it going since we only have until 10 o'clock together, another half hour. Some of you are in a different time zone, but that's what it is here. So let's look at because, but so. This is another, here's a true false question. It requires more focus uh, and specific thinking than just answering a question. Is that true or false? Yeah, it's true. So, and I have the example, why do seeds need light to grow versus and then you have your because but so this is a formative assessment you can have the students complete these ideas as a way of checking for understanding and again we can practice this one with your this now assume that your students have read and learned about abraham lincoln you already have knowledge about abraham lincoln as an adult um, so what would you say about abraham lincoln with a because statement a but and a so Yes, and, it, and Alyssa, I totally agree with you. This is a great way to do a speaking activity before you do the writing. We, um, I remember, uh, you know, verbalize to internalize from Rick Duvall. That's such a great line. If you want kids to process this orally first and then put it in writing, they could pair up verbally say their because but so's and then go back to their tables and write the ideas. Or they could write it first and then share. It's um, to win on lots of levels. So choose one and just write one in the chat. Normally it's best to do all three, but for time, let's just try one. Abraham Lincoln was a great president because, but, so. Pausing on the video isn't very fun, but it is what it is, learning experience.
Does that okay? Good. Abraham Lincoln was a great president because he led with honesty and heart. Excellent. Ooh, Abraham Lincoln, there's a good butt one in here, was a great president, comma, but I, as I am Australian, I have a little background now to explain my reason. Very good. Yes, if you live in the United States, we do. Mm -hmm. Yes, Abraham Lincoln was a great president, comma, so a memorial to him lies in Washington, D.C., That's a good complex sentence, Carol. Abraham Lincoln was a great president, comma, but when he was assassinated, comma, his influence was greatly diminished. Okay, well done, ladies and gentlemen. There's a simple one. Abraham Lincoln was a great president because he ended slavery. Okay, you're getting the idea. Nice job. Okay. So we have a level two example, which we'll just talk through. These are um, George Gershwin, right? So if you have background knowledge about George Gershwin, then you can see the question here is, um, if you don't have background knowledge on a subject, writing a complex, doing a because but so, and having it be interesting and meaningful is going to be a challenge. So here's an example from level two. George Gershwin is considered a musical genius because he captured and expressed the spirit of American life in his rhythms, harmonies, and melodies. But some have criticized him for structural weakness in some of his works. So many composers have tried to emulate his style. So um, again, this is background knowledge is really important here. And you can see that this is something you could do along the way modeling and also as a post uh, way of getting kids to process the text. So you just wanna remember if you're using something like this or that requires background knowledge, I mean, don't use this with your class unless you've, and unless you've studied this, right? So that they have the knowledge. And if you have studied, um, George Gershwin, and you give them an activity like this, and they can only answer one of them, they just can't think of anything. Um, that's a good indication that they have not comprehended what they've been studying about. And if you consider this content important to what you're teaching, you might want to go back and reteach or teach in a different way so that they do absorb uh, that content. Well, would you would you ever combine with older sentences? all three, the but, the um, the because, but, so in one sentence? No, I don't think so. The, they all do something completely different. So the, the idea is to do these separately um, to sort out, just sort out your analytical thinking about this particular topic. That's exactly right. These are these are separate ideas. Um, you know, the because is the cause and effect. Um, no, it's telling something that's true. I said that wrong. But the, the because is naming something that's true. This is from our first day. Um, the but is is doing that U-turn, right? And the so is the is the cause and effect. Yeah, George I mean, Gershwin is considered a musical genius. So composers have tried to emulate his work. I mean, you could take, if you wanted to, because but in particular is the one that, that goes 180 degrees opposite, you could combine... Um, uh, you could combine because and then but you could say George Gershwin is considered a musical genius because he captured and expressed blah 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 but some have criticized him for the structural weaknesses in some of his works um, or you could combine the first one with the third one but I don't think you'd ever want to put all three of these in one sentence because it just there's too it many it would create run-ons which is yeah, what yeah, yeah that's what a they're lot just, of our... they're just too many thoughts in there um and i'm just trying to see here um i don't think you would it doesn't make sense to me to combine um but and so mm -hmm. but to combine because and but and because and so kind of makes sense yeah it is about the analytical thinking 
That's a good question is because kind of part of a, a fanboy, um, it is a coordinating conjunction. So it's just, you could, I would argue that yes, sort of it is. <laughs> but do well, others have but, a comment on that? <laughs> well, yeah, if you, um, because is, because it's not one of the fanboys, okay? The B in fanboy stands for but, but. not for because. Mm -hmm. yep. So the only other type of conjunction it can be is a subordinating conjunction. And you can see that in, um, it's important to know because when you're doing your punctuation, um, you're not, if you have a, you do your main clause and then you have your second clause beginning with but, or beginning with because, you're gonna have a comma after your first clause before the word because. But if you're doing a sentence that has but, a, you know, a coordinating conjunction in the middle, there's no um, there's no comma before the yeah, coordinating conjunction. Yeah, that's why it's not in there. Thank you, Mary. That's 100% right. Because when we go back to that, these all have a comma after. And no, because... These, these, those are the ones that don't. Yes, they do. After? Or before, I'm sorry, before. Oh, sorry. Yes, I said it wrong. Yeah, sorry. Gonna, <laughs> they oh, have a exactly. comma before, yeah. yes. Yeah, when we start talking about this in the abstract, it becomes weird, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, it's, depending on whether it's coordinating or subordinating determines whether or not you have that comma before the conjunction. Yes, And I said it wrong. if it's a fanboys, yes, you do. And if it's a subordinating, no, you don't, unless you take your subordinate clause and put it first in your sentence. Then you have to have a, a comma at the end of that clause before you move into your independent clause. Okay, we we digress. Yes, but that was a good question, and that's all about the learning. So, you know, it's technically not a part of it um, well, because of, of it, the it's, comma. It mm -hmm. seems so arbitrary in a lot of ways, right? Because, but it's just the way that it, that our language is organized, and somebody's decided that because should be on the subordinating side, and but should be on the coordinating side. Okay, thanks for clarifying. So we learn better together. All right, we're gonna go on to chapter two, uh, understanding sentences, ex sentence expansion and note taking. And this all begins with the kernel sentence. The dog sits, he leads. These are basic, simple sentences. You can use this, teach this to kindergartners from an oral language perspective, identifying what a sentence is because it has a subject and a predicate, a noun, a verb, a doer and a do, um, who did what, that's, the, little kids can understand that, right? So we can start with our kernel sentence and then we wanna do something more with it. But before you can do something more, you have to understand what isn't a sentence. So spending a time in your class identifying what makes a sentence and what is a fragment is very useful. So my friend is going to, is that a complete sentence? No, because it's missing the rest of it. My friend is sitting with me, my friend over, um, my friend likes to play with my dog, you know, so we need the, the rest of it, the doer and the do needs to be there. Um, the dog sits, again, that would be, is that a sentence or not a sentence? The dog sits sentence, right? Because we have the subject, the dog, and what they're doing, it's sitting, the dog sits. When you do these kinds of activities, identifying kernel sentence versus fragment, you don't want there to be any punctuation and no capital letters. Um, and then you just work through the examples discussing whether or not something is or is not a sentence. So over the dam, everybody, is that fragment or a sentence? Fragment. I saw Sandra's mouth move. Yep. The teacher talked. Fragment or sentence? Sentence. Yep. Reading the book. Fragment. Mm -hmm. Dogs bark. Sentence, right? We have the dog and what's it doing? Barking. Dogs bark. The law was passed. Sentence. And I just want to point out for that one, it's it's not the, the law isn't doing passing, but the law was acted upon, it was passed. So this is a, a passive construction of a sentence rather than an active construction. But regardless of whether it's active or passive, this sentence has a subject and it has a predicate. So it's a sentence. Exactly. Tossed the ball. Fragment or sentence? Fragment. Mm -hmm. Who tossed the ball? We don't know. The broken bottle, fragment or sentence, fragment, exactly. 
Okay. And I think sometimes the certain of these um, <clears throat> confuse people like sitting with you. It's a fragment, but you'll have some kids who really don't understand the concept. They'll say, well, sitting is a, a verb and you is a noun. It's, it's got both. It's, it must be a sentence, but you is not being used as a subject. It's being used as the object of a preposition. So it's there, it does not have the subject that, and the predicate. Exactly. Okay, questions or wonderings on that? All right. So we take a kernel sentence and we expand it using question words. And in the writing revolution, they do two weird things. One is um, when you list the questions, they suggest that you list them in the order that are frequently posted in classrooms, who, what, when, where, why, how, right? But when you actually work with adding um, using these question words, they want you to start with the when. So that's why when has a double asterisk next to it, because that's always going to be how we start um, our kernel sentences with the when, if it's appropriate, and then where and why would follow. So let's look at an example here. Pyramids were built when ancient times, where Egypt, why to protect a body um, protect the body of the de deceased pharaoh that's the why and the answers need to be written in shortened form not in complete sentences they just want you to give the most important detail and that's it they would be written on a dotted line to show that they're just notes so the expanded sentence is in ancient times comma pyramids were built in egypt to protect the body of the deceased pharaoh there's the when. In ancient times, the what, pyramids were built, and uh, the why, to protect the body, the where, excuse me, pyramids were built um, to protect the body of the deceased pharaoh. And I just want to point out this phrase in the beginning, in ancient times, that tells us when the writing revolution likes us to have our students begin their sentences with that when. It's not a, a, a sentence structure that we use very often in speech but you'll find it in writing. You could, you, you perfectly can take this and you could go pyramids were built in ancient times in Egypt or pyramids were built in Egypt in ancient times. You can move that around, but for the purposes of the writing revolution, they like you to have your students begin with this all the time. And this big, this is the rationale for that it goes back to what Anita Archer talks about in building a cognitive routine. So there's a group of people that say, but isn't that too formulaic? And is it, aren't they going to get stifly and all that? And the argument is, is quite the opposite, that you're actually giving them this powerful way of <clears throat> processing the content, starting it the same way. And eventually, because you're going to change those question words based on the subject that you're reading about and what you're writing about, there's going to naturally become variation, but you give them this formula on purpose in the beginning to build that cognitive routine. So don't let that shy you off. <clears throat> the other part, as Mary just said again, was we don't speak with the when first. That's a written convention. And when you teach kids to write with that, you're automatically elevating both the, the quality of their writing and their ability to comprehend when they see that same structure in print. So this is our breakout room opportunity. We're going to have you work and um, identify the kernel sentences using a, a short article from the Vietnam Memorial. And one way to create a kernel sentence is to actually take an image from something you're studying and use that image to create that kernel and then have the kids write about it. So there's lots of ways you could create a kernel sentence. This is just one of the ideas that we want to share with you. So here's our kernel, the Vietnam Memorial was built. Okay, so the when, where, why. We're gonna copy this link and put it into the chat for you. If you have the slide deck open, um, you're able to click on it yourself. If not, there's a very brief article on the Vietnam Memorial. We're gonna put you into groups and we want you to answer in note form those three questions and then create an expanded sentence answering them in that in that order. Make sense? And make sure you have that article opened up so that you can refer to it because um, when we were discussing this the other day, we just 
we discovered that depending maybe on the generation in which you were born, um, the, the answers to when, where, and why might not be uh, background knowledge for you. So we want you to read the article first so that you're actually basing this on something factual. So how long will we take on this, Amy? Oh, I don't think it's going to take them very long, maybe six or seven minutes at the most. It's going okay. to go quick. Yeah, All the right. article is short. It's a couple paragraphs. So Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to send you into some breakout rooms and um, we'll see how that goes. I wonder maybe I should reduce it by one. No, we'll leave it at this. Well, there'll be a fairly small four or five people in your room. So you'll all have a chance to participate. And just remember, those who do the work are those who learn the best, right? So <laughs> type your answers. <laughs> so write your answers on your um on your own paper. And when we come back, we're going to ask you to put some of the samples in the chat. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. yep. Okay. I'm just going to um, stop my recording. Marianne. Oh, too late. Okay. <laughs> I was going to pop into a room and see what they were doing. Oh, people are popping back on. Okay. Okay, if you are on, um, so waiting for a few. Did you need more time? Was that not enough time? You needed more time, Ian, or it was enough time? I'm sorry, it, it was enough time. We, we okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. Okay. Um, Maura, did you have a group that you worked with? Are you still on? Uh, we, I had um, Elizabeth and, right? I, who was the other? Don. Who were you? Awesome, Don. Don. Oh yeah, she had a great story. Oh, can you tell your story about the mall? I love this story. <laughs> it was just a cute, funny story. When my daughter was, I don't know, we were at, in Washington, D.C. And I said, okay, we're going to go to the mall. You know, and she was about 10 or 12. She goes, good, I forgot my sunglasses. I need to buy a pair. <laughs> so every time I think about prior knowledge and what a mall means to a 10 or 12 year old, right? Yeah. So did you want um, the information we gathered or the sentence we created or? Yeah, let's do your, who, what were your answers to your questions? Okay. First. So when 1982, mm -hmm. where Washington, D.C., I suppose you could have something more specific as well. Mm -hmm. And then why to honor over 58,000 service members who gave their lives between 1957 and 1975 or who gave their lives in the Vietnam War, something like that. Okay. Okay. So for the why, you might keep the note short to just say to honor service members. And then okay. when you write your expanded sentence, you would include all the other stuff you just said, right? Because you oh, know right. it, okay. right? Yeah. Because we're just taking the notes. Yes. The notes would be, so then yeah, go ahead and read your sentence. Okay. Does it, Don, do you have it? Do you want to read it? Sure. We said um, the Vietnam Memorial was built in 1982 in Washington, DC. It was built to honor the it was built to honor the service members who gave their lives between 1957 and 1975 in the Vietnam War. Can you combine Is that two that sentences? Into, can yeah. you combine it into one sentence? How would you do that? Yes. Oh, and we want to start with the when, correct? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So in 1982, the Vietnam Memorial was built in Washington, DC to honor over 58,000 service members who gave their lives in the Vietnam War. Perfect. That's an excellent okay. sentence. And you've got all the details captured in one complex sentence. Nice. And there was nothing wrong with the two sentences you had. It's just mm -hmm. for this activity, we want it all in one sentence and we want to start with the when. Exactly. Okay. I see and one in the in the chat the Vietnam Memorial was built in 1982 in Washington, DC to commemorate service members that gave their lives in the war. That is a complete starting. Uh, and it's actually that's starting with the what. So the when would be in 1982, comma, 
the um, Vietnam Memorial was built. But again, your sentence is good. You've got all of the elements. You just started with the what, not the when. Anyone else want to share theirs in the, in the chat? Dedicated in 1982, comma, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., comma, was built to honor the U.S. veterans who died in the Vietnam War. I think that's good. I don't think you need the comma after DC, but yeah, I don't either. Yep. The next one in 1982, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was built in Washington, DC to honor the men and women keeps uh, of the United States Armed Forces who served in the Vietnam War. Good. Yeah, these are all good. And you see yeah. how similar they are, right? They should be similar. Mm hmm. It should be. Well done. And Starting then this one that. is uh, in 1982, the Vietnam Memorial was built in Washington, D.C. to honor service members who died or didn't return home from the war. So, you know, the, yes, there are people on there that are were unaccounted for. Mm -hmm. And here's one yeah. a little more specific about the where. In 1982, the Vietnam Memorial was built in the National Mall and Memorial Parks, Washington, D.C., to honor over 58,000 service members who gave their life. So, you know, it, you can see like the more, if you're trying to do it all in one sentence, the more information you squeeze in there, the, the more difficult it, it becomes to uh, work your way through the sentence because there's a lot of information in there. Okay, yes. Um, so the question now from Alana, why, uh, why start with the when? And this comes back to two things. First of all, let me reshare my screen. Um, the cognitive routine for students, being able to know that they are going to begin with that when, helps them structure the sentence in a way that aligns with how we read a lot of social studies and science texts. They're going to begin with the when and then continue on with the what and the where and, and the why and so on. So it's twofold. One is that we don't typically speak starting with the when, but most complex text um, on social studies and science content will often use that sentence structure that has the when and that leads with the when. So you're getting them to um, learn how to recognize that sentence structure, write from that sentence structure, and um, comprehend from that sentence structure. Okay. So it's Does both, that help an, answer? It's yeah. both an instructional routine to get the kids in a mindset, and it also is um, helping them to, um, to parse sentences that begin with a when because we don't encounter it in speech very often. So this should, this should help them in their comprehension of reading complex sentences in their grade level text. But yeah, you know, and I there's nothing the wrong with moving the when somewhere else. It's just, I think that's further down the road when you become proficient and you always, you know how to do it with the when, where, why. Now you can start to move them around, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you're starting with this routine and then eventually you expand upon it. And Alyssa, I agree with your comment that teaching this routine with ELs, with English learners, very powerful um, for so many reasons. And yes, it's going to help them perform better on those. I know we take the, the access test here. If you use any of the WIDA assessments, you're, you're, it's a win for them as well. Okay, great. So um, a couple tips on page 63 in your book, there's a list of several bulleted points. They're really worth taking a moment to process. Um, Mary was like, why aren't these common sense? I'm like, well, they put them in the book. So <laughs> I think that there's a reason they're there that we might assume that we all have knowledge of these great tips, but sometimes um, we forget those, those pieces that are really common sense. So um, page 63, check that out. And one of the things too, when you're doing an expanded sentence, do not use a command um, because that can be really difficult to determine who the subject is. So the subject is usually complied, implied. You know, if I say sit down, well, okay, who am I telling to sit down? The dog, my child that's being naughty, you know, like who is it? So 
when there's a, an implied subject, we can get into some trouble there. You want to have <clears throat> enough to work with. Uh, and sometimes what they'll do for some of these expanded sentences, when they want to teach the kids to do a better who, they will use a pronoun. So it'll say like, he is the 16th president of the United States. And then you have to know it's Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln is the 16th president of the United States. So uh, that's the way to get the who in there. You, you swap it out with a pronoun and then the students have to retrieve uh, either by going back to the text in a close read or from their memory and their learning um, what the answer was. Okay, questions, comments, or wonderings about that? Susan, you're muted. I see you talking. I do often um, help students when they're answering, like, you know, you get done reading a short comprehension or short reading, and then they have those questions, you know, and like you said, the students want to write, he did this, she did that, they did this. So I always tell them, pretend the question's not there and the reader has not read the question. Now answer it. So you tell the reader who you're talking about, because it is a huge thing, especially in elementary school that we always want to just throw a pronoun in there because they do assume that the reader knows already what the question was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they also want to start with because, right? They're starting it as a fragment. They're not even, they don't know how. So that's a whole other skill set in teaching how to answer a question using the question words to, um, to get there. Uh, and this is the other way around where we have a kernel sentence and we are expanding it using the question words. But both are wins. And the other side of that, just to piggyback off on your comment, is, is that whole metacognitive piece. If they're doing a reading and you get to the end of that paragraph and you ask them, okay, who did you just read about or what just happened? And you can't recall. <laughs> okay, well, then we have to go back and do some work to understand that paragraph again. So it's all related, right? This is where that reading and writing connection is so powerful. A command always has the subject you, as in the sentence, you sit down. Um, I, I think that, that that is my comment on don't start with a command. That is directly from the writing revolution. So <clears throat> you could say it's a you, but is it always? I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe there's a rule. I mean, Mary, can, go ahead. You can you can have a sentence, <clears throat> like say, um, say your <clears throat> patch is named Rover, you can say, Rover, get down, you know, and in that case, it's not, it, if you're saying, you're not saying you get down, you're saying Rover, get down. So it's not always implied, but even when it's, even when it's stated, it's not a type of sentence that's easy to take and expand on. It just doesn't lend itself to that. So just for a sentence expansion, just avoid avoid commands. What would you say? Rover, you big red spotted dog who I acquired in 1956. You know, you it's just like you can't, it just doesn't lend itself to this particular activity. <laughs> Your example is funny. Okay. Let's go on to note taking so we don't run out of time. And what I will share too is that whatever we don't get to, we pick up in the next session. I don't want us to feel rushed. So um just know that we'll we use I will usually incorporate some review in each of our sessions so you feel like you can own the content better. So note taking why it matters and what we gain. Um, this is from page 63. It's at the bottom of the page. You can read these right. Note taking reduces reading and in, um, into keywords and phrases helps us do abbreviations better and um, allows us to distinguish essential from non-essential material. Note-taking helps us boost our comprehension. Um, there's been research on students who have taken handwritten notes versus students who've taken computer notes. This was done with college level students. And what they found was that when they did an immediate assessment on the hand notes and the computer notes, it was the same in terms of what they learned, but then they assessed the students a few days later on the same content. And the students who did the handwritten notes did better than the students that did the um, computer notes. And one of the reasons for that was that when you write by hand, 
you have to consolidate. You can't write every single thing. And they found that when students were taking notes on a computer, they were attempting to transcribe what the speaker said and therefore not processing it to the same degree as those who were consolidating it. So it's not necessarily that writing by hand is, we don't know the answer to that, okay? People extrapolate that research and say, oh, writing by hand is exponentially better. It's really about the thinking that, that goes into what you're capturing in your notes. So. Yeah, you're taking the information <clears throat> that you've read and you're distilling it to get the main points. And you do that by taking that, that large chunk of text and you reduce it down into keywords, phrases, abbreviations, and using symbols rather than, as Amy said, transcribing the whole thing. You know, you'll see a lot of kids in middle school classes where they um, often teach note taking, and their idea of note taking is they just want to they want to put every word write down, it down, just yeah. copy it down. And and if you do that, you're not you're not using your brain to. Um, to pull out, this is the key point, this is a sub point, this is how this point's related to this one. You're not, you're not making any, you're not doing any of that analysis. So I like what Trina just put in here, reading, writing is thinking. It, yes, yep. yes, it is. Reading is thinking and writing is thinking. We yes. can't just regurgitate it. So note taking helps us absorb and retain this information better. Uh, it promotes that analytical thinking as, as Mary just pointed out. And we do need to teach kids how to take efficient notes. And I, what I love about the writing revolution is nothing is taken for granted. Everything is explicitly taught, including this note taking technique. So, and um, they'll also use the simple note taking technique to help students learn how to eventually write a single paragraph outline and a multi paragraph outline that's coming down the road in future chapters. So everything builds on itself. So here's an example right from the writing revolution. They have, um, not from the book, but from their website, they have a whole list of teacher resources that are set up to teach kids how to do this work using content. So usually the article is included along with these great activities you can do. And this is one on John Lewis. The article comes from New ELA. And um, what you're seeing here at the top are the symbols that, that the Writing Revolution recommends that you teach. Now, of course, there's other symbols you could do. You could use your own, but they're teaching the kids that a slash is a new idea. We've got the plus, uh, the answer and the word or. Um, equals, obviously, an arrow leads to an up increase, a down decrease. Okay, so let's take those ideas and show you what they look like. We've got John Lewis was a courageous and selfless leader. If we want to turn that into notes, we would abbreviate JL equals courageous plus selfless leader. So they take this sentence from the article and they turn it into notes. John Lewis was denied a library card, comma, which led him to become an avid reader. We've got a subordinating conjunction there, which led to pendant clause, which led him to become an avid reader. So JL, okay, what grade level should um, be note, should note taking begin? That's a really great question, Rachel. And I, they would I argue the intermediate grades, three, four, five, um, but it's, it's in service of a larger piece and you're doing it in a really controlled way. So not the really little people, a little bit, a little bit older. Okay. All right, so I, I'm not gonna read all these to you. You get the idea with the increase um, through his actions, comma, John Lewis increased awareness of civil rights issues. So we got an, arrow, an up arrow, um, Martin Luther King and John Lewis led protests that ultimately reduced racial discrimination, we've got the down arrow showing something changed. So just the most important parts. This is hard for kids. And so you have to do a lot of this together. A lot of this is modeling and we do's. You're not assigning this. Um, the research, eventually you'll move into collaborative groups. So you'll do some modeling and, and some leading it. And then you'll want to put kids in in groups and have them work together. Uh, there's a lot of strong research on collaborative groups being helpful. 
Yes, thank you, Mary. If you do this in, in the intermediate grades, the middle school kids are set up to succeed. So if you were going to turn, this is from the article, it's linked here. If you were going to turn John Lewis and the equal sign Congressman New York into a simple sentence, what would that be? And here's the article in case people aren't familiar with who John Lewis is. Somebody just say the sentence. John Lewis is a congressman from New York. Yep, and he's now deceased, so it was as appropriate. John Lewis was a congressman in New York. Very good. Um, and then we've got another idea, 1986. New idea, John Lewis elected to US Congress. Um, we've got the up arrow, meaning increased public awareness about injustice. A sentence from that. And it's starting with the when, right? In 1986, comma. John Lewis was elected to, to US Congress. And his work increased public injustice. Yeah, 1986, comma, John Lewis was elected to US Congress and increased public awareness about injustice. Okay. And the last one, John Lewis. John Lewis was the senior deputy of the Democratic Party and helped, helped to keep them unified. Okay. The note taking is really important and we definitely want you to be able to create notes from um, these sentences. If I'm gonna quickly go back to, I'm just gonna stop share before we get here and click on the Padlet. Throw that into the chat. I'm going to see if you can open this again. Um, on the Padlet, if I scooch over, you will see, oh, whoops, messed that up a little bit. Over here under the Writing Revolution resources, You, you're probably going to have to create an account. This is going to open for me because I have an account through the Writing Revolution. And this is where I got those activities from. It's so free th and it's free to open that account. You don't have to pay yes. anything. Yes, that's right. So there's quite a few. Um, if you're like, I am just not sure how to do this, <laughs> right? You could go into this article on what is Juneteenth and you've, you'll be given a great article. It's usually linked. Uh, right here, what is Juneteenth? It might be a video. And and then you've got these kernel sentences. It spread. What? When? Where? And then you write the expanded sentence. So you do the learning. It's all provided for you. And uh, this is a great way to model the process. Quite a few things on here already. And all of them, I would say, are social studies based. A few of them are um, science, but mostly a lot of history here, a little bit of science. So the expanding the grades, obviously the spring could be used with little people. Most of it is geared towards the older kids though. So check that out, create the, um, create the, the login and explore on here because there's really great resources that you can tap into that they give to you for free. So. Okay, so we are at our 1015 time. I'm so glad that you spent a little time with us this morning. I hope you got some good review of the key chapters, key ideas from chapters one and two. And we will see you again, hopefully on Saturday, July 9th, nine o'clock central time and look for the recording to be posted on our um, YouTube page for the, for the Reading League Wisconsin. And with that, we thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Amy. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Yes, thank you all. You're welcome. It was fun.
Thanks for engaging with us. We really appreciate it. If you need a certificate, be sure to click on the link that Mary put in for attendance. I'll pop it in there again. Amy. Yes. What, what chapters will be covered in the next session? Probably should have mentioned that. <laughs> chapter three? I think chapter three and four, right, Mary? Three and four. Yeah. Three, three and four. four. Yep. Yes. We and we'll when do that. Come, when you come to log on, <clears throat> we'll send you a um a link the day uh, or like a, a resend of your Zoom confirmation email the day before that we the day before we do each session. And don't let it confuse you because our first session was on Sunday. And even though we're using the same link all the time, Zoom does not adjust the dates. So it'll say like, you're registered for this meeting on Sunday, whatever. Don't let that confuse you. We're just using the same link for each session. And um, we will send you that reminder. And we'll also post a reminder on our in our Facebook group. Anything else, Amy, that we need to... Think so. Um, I think so. I think that's it. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate your spending a little bit of your Saturday morning with us, and we'll be have, we, have a happy Fourth of July, and we'll see you back <laughs> here on July 9th. Uh, Mary, sorry. Can I ask you a quick question? I think it got lost in the chat. Is it at all possible to get a certificate from last Sunday? I uh, email me. Um, um, Mary at the Reading League was, no, oh, no, never mind. To, um, to just send an email to Reading League Wisconsin at gmail.com. Okay, is Wisconsin spelled out? Yep, yeah, it is. Here, let me just, I'll type it in here Reading League Wisconsin at gmail.com. If you send me an email there and say you for you just didn't get <clears throat> didn't get into the list of people for a certificate last Sunday, then I'll just um, send you an individual one. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.